Uh, my name is Brian London. I am the editor and owner of Gold Newsletter and the proprietor of the New Orleans Investment Conference. I have the enviable position of presenting right before happy hour today. Um, I have presented before happy hour, I have presented after happy hour, and I can tell you that after happy hour is a lot more fun. Uh, and my conference this year, I actually put an open bar in the back of the room during my presentation, and that was even more fun. Uh, you don't enjoy that luxury today, you'll have to listen to me sober, so good luck with that. Um, the pause that refreshes, uh, I just put this presentation together uh, day before yesterday, and it's a brand new one I'm not that familiar with that are just through a lot of interesting charts, most of them from the February issue of my newsletter just came out. Uh, so pardon me if I don't know the exact sequence, but this moves everything, the pause that refreshes. You know, we're looking, and you'll hear a lot of speakers very intelligently talking about a lot of things that are going on in the economy, nothing matters except what this man and his compadres will do. This drives everything. Central bank liquidity has driven every market since 2008, and to a lesser extent, ever since Volcker started lowering rates after he killed off inflation in the early 1980s. This is all you need to worry about. What is the Fed going to do? No more fundamentals matter except what the Fed is going to do. That's a sad state of being, but it is the reality of today. So let's look at what's going on right now. Gold looks ahead. The markets are anticipating the end of the Fed's rate hike crusade, but none so much as gold. Markets are predictive mechanisms. They look ahead and discount the future, at least what they believe the future to be, uh, especially gold. Gold's very good at this, believe it or not. Uh, if you look at the track record, track record for gold since it's become a free trading asset in 1974, uh, the very end of 1974, it has done a good job of tracking the markets, tracking what's about to happen if you look at it correctly. Now, while some, as an example of this, while some bemoan gold's response to inflation, you know, inflation really perked up, obviously, from about mid-year last year, um, and gold didn't do much. It finished the end the year basically flat, which was a great relative performance compared to a lot of other things. But inflation rate was soaring and gold was not doing anything. But gold actually predicted everything that happened and responded to it all. Gold looked ahead at COVID. If you look at the bottom of this chart, it actually started responding in the end of 2019. People don't realize the Fed did about $500 billion worth of quantitative easing before COVID ever hit in August and September of 2019. Gold started to move up back then. It sensed something was going to come. It predicted a COVID, essentially. You look at that big drop there uh, at the beginning of 20, that's about March of 2020. You have that big drop in gold, and gold soared because gold looked ahead and knew that the Fed's policy prescription, its, what it, its policy response was going to be an overwhelming uh, amount of monetary liquidity. Monetary adrenaline shot into the veins of the economy and the global economy. And it catapulted up to a new trading level and just stayed there. It did what it expected. That trading level between 1750 to 2000 was basically where it went from about 1150 or so before then in anticipation of the inflation rates that we are seeing, just recently saw and are coming down from today. So now it's doing it again. Uh, if you look back around November 7th, that was early November, that was the bottom. Uh, and gold is telling us something. It's looking ahead. What is it seeing ahead? Now, it's not the only thing seen looking ahead. As I mentioned, all of the markets are starting to anticipate the Fed easing off, taking its foot off the gas pedal. Now, it's important to differentiate between a pivot and a pause. A pivot would absolutely set every market afire. And, you know, the markets are looking forward toward the end of this year for some sort of a pivot. I don't know if we'll see that, but I don't think we need that. We just need the Fed to stop, just to pause. And that's enough to light markets on fire. It's a bull market, baby. Um, everybody in this room, well, I don't want to generalized. Most people in this room are still kind of down in the dumps. 
If you look at the gold bug, the silver bug community, the sentiment is really in the dumps, has been. And over the past three months, we've gained $300 in the gold price since that bottom on November, early November. That's a bull market. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I can see the future. I don't know how long it'll last, but that is the definition of a bull market. And sentiment still remains muted. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, it's not necessarily the overpowering thing. People think, well, it's a good thing because nobody's really excited in the junior sector. Uh, I have news for you. The gold market really doesn't care what the junior sector thinks. Uh, it is going to move and do what it's going to do for whatever reasons are out there, macroeconomic reasons, the big picture reasons. And this market out there, the junior mining stocks, will follow along no matter on what gold does. So if this trend keeps up, they will respond. But the, why are you skeptic? Uh, why you're skeptical about gold? Two reasons, the underperformance, supposed underperformance of mining stocks and the underperformance of silver. So let's take a look at that. Uh, gold to GDX. This is gold divided by the GDX. When it, that line is going downward, the mining stocks are outperforming gold. We see that in this three-month period of outperformance or performance of gold, where gold gained $300 an ounce, the mining stocks outperformed. Specifically, as you can see in this performance chart, the uh, GDX rose 46 percent, over 46 percent, while gold gained over 18 percent. Now, you can argue that maybe it should have done more. Uh, the mining stocks should have offered more leverage. That's pretty damn good. That's, that's leverage on the majors. The reason why we are all skeptical right now, or at least uh, not very enthusiastic, is because those companies out there really haven't performed like this. But they will. If this trend continues, they will. And they have already started to wake up. If you look at a lot of the individual stocks, if you look at uh, this issue of gold newsletter, one of the things that hit me, I just went through and picked maybe half of the companies that we cover, maybe a third of them, put up their three-month charts. And I was amazed when the issue actually came out how many of them were moving from the lower left to the upper right, some of them quite significantly. So it's happening right now. There's still great bargains out there. You haven't missed anything. Or you've missed a little bit, yeah. But, but there's still a lot more. What, what we have seen so far, if this trend continues again, uh, is just a fraction of what we're going to see in the days ahead. Gold to silver ratio, silver's outperformance, underperformance relative to gold is a big topic. Silver's been in the dumps relative to gold, hasn't really responded. You, here's this chart of the gold-silver ratio, and you can see that underperformance only came in around mid-December. So it's really only the last few weeks that we've seen an underperformance. A few weeks, last month or so, I guess. Uh, time flies. But it really is the last half of this move in gold that, gold that silver has not really responded. Part of this, too, is silver is predictive in itself. Gold is uh, very overbought right now. And uh, if it continues upward over the next few days and weeks, that would be extremely significant. But gold can work off that overbought condition by just hanging around uh, for a period of time, um, which it kind of seems to be doing right now, but we'll see. So looking at the big picture, if the Fed is driving everything, if monetary policy drives all the markets, and it's important to understand that this is a process that's been going on for 43 years or so. Ever since Volcker killed off inflation and started actually pulling rates down, the markets have become ever more reliant on easy money policies, on the Fed coming in to rescue them whenever there's been any hiccup in the markets. Uh, and post-2008, that's really accelerated. So now the markets are addicted uh, not just to easy money, but ever easier money. That's why in COVID, they had to take everything that they did in 2008 and multiply it, uh, do much more to get the same effect. The addict has developed a tolerance to the drug, so it needs more and more of that drug to get the same effect. In the next crisis, which is coming, don't, you know, make no mistake, the next crisis is coming, and when that happens, you will be amazed at what the Fed is going to do, and all of the central banks. But right now, they are so addicted that all they need is a pause. So there's two possible scenarios coming up. 
granted, the, this is an assumption. The first assumption we have is that the Fed is nearing the end of its rate hike cycle. It has to. The latest numbers came out yesterday. A number of you may have seen me tweet this out. The interest on the federal debt in the U.S. rose to a new record high of $853 billion a year, every year, going to air, not getting anything. It's more than they spend on, on defense now. It's more than spent in any entitlement program. Um, and that is adding to the federal debt and the deficit as we speak. That is a, a brick wall in the way of the in the way of the Fed. They cannot go to 5% interest rates for longer, as they say they will. It's just fiscally impossible. Uh, there are some other things that could happen I'll get to in a minute. But the assumption is they are going to pause or pivot. Two, two ways this could go. They pause or pivot after getting inflation near their 2% target. Hallelujah, that would be great. That would be great for all the markets. Everything gets lifted up by this new liquidity or easing, relative easing. Stocks, bonds, commodities, gold, silver, everything rises. Okay, second scenario, Fed pauses or pivots without getting inflation anywhere near their target of 2%. This, in my mind, is the most likely scenario. A good friend of mine, Peter Bookvar, who I uh, really respect on this, doesn't think they're going to be able to get it past 4%, maybe 4 to 5%. That is a persistently high rate of inflation. That discounts any gains in any other asset class by 5%. That's a barrier. They have, it, stocks have to go up 5% before it makes any money for anybody every year. Point being, if the Fed pauses or pivots without hitting that inflation number for any number of reasons, then that scenario is no longer bullish for everything. It's no longer bullish for stocks, no longer bullish for bonds, because you have that 4 to 5% drag on returns. It is, however, very bullish for gold and silver. And I'm not saying that that alone, everybody's going to go into gold and silver, but you will see global portfolio allocations all of a sudden shift, maybe 1% from stocks, maybe 1% from bonds into gold and silver, especially if there's an upward trend to follow. That's enough to light this market afire because this is relative to those huge pools of capital, a very tiny market. Those shifts would be enough to buy every available investment a couple times over in the sector. And so that's one scenario that I think is possible. And I think at least it's likely that the Fed will not reach its 2% target. Uh, granted, this is due to my uh, overabiding faith in the government to screw things up. The Fed has not been right in any respect or correct. And I think that trend will continue. So gold, this is a decoupling. That scenario would be represent a decoupling of gold from these other asset classes. Gold has already shown it can break free. I think we're seeing a bit of a signal, an indication that this might just happen. Uh, gold versus S&P 500, we see that they didn't quite track each other. Going into early December, the bottom chart here is the rolling 20-day correlation. If you get close to one, that's a perfect lockstep correlation, go up and down together. If you get below zero, you have an inverse correlation. One goes up, the other goes down. We see that gold and the S&P, gold and U.S. stocks, became inversely correlated for a while in December. What's different is there was a couple of other instances where this happened since the Fed began raising rates in March. In both of those instances, though, that was because gold was going down and stocks were going up. This was the first time that gold was going up and stocks were going down. This was a decoupling in gold's favor. So this may be an indication, well, it's at least it's an indication that the kind of decoupling I'm talking about can happen in gold's favor. Now, this is the point I just made. If the Fed can't kill off inflation, huge global money flows will be directed into gold. And the Fed's rate hike crusade is going to end for one of three reasons. Markets are addicted to ever easier money. The stock market could totally collapse at some point. Maybe it smells a recession coming up. But the Fed will have to come in if the decline is great enough to rescue the stock market because due to the wealth effect that they sought, 
the Fed has made the stock market the U.S. economy. They're indistinguishable at this point. Something will break in the financial plumbing, likely the bond market. We explored a lot of this at my uh, New Orleans conference this fall with some really great experts. And this is kind of where everybody uh, looked at, at what was going to happen. The bond market, the global bond market, in fact, is set up for this easy money. Uh, rates, rate rises this steep, this severe, is uh, fair to say not, not healthy for the way things have been set up for the past 15 years or so. Um, something is very likely to break. In fact, this period, this cycle is notable for not having a Lehman moment. Uh, and something is very likely to happen at some point to force the Fed to come in and rescue the markets. Uh, interest expense in the federal debt, I just touched on that. It is headed toward $1 trillion and higher. Uh, that, I think, is both a political and a fiscal barrier to the Fed continuing. Where we are now, uh, gold has posted a golden cross in recent days where the 50-day moving average passed through the 200-day moving average. Uh, that's important. That brings a number of generalist investors, more technically oriented, trend-following investors, into the market. And it appears to be doing that. As you can see, the gold price rose uh, fairly significantly as it was approaching that golden cross and afterwards. Of course, we've been in a pause for the last couple of days, but this is an important technical indicator. Uh, let's look at the history here. This is 2000 to 2009. These Blue arrows are instances where we've had golden crosses before. As you can see, in that period, which was a wonderful market, as we all remember so fondly, uh, people involved in the sector made an awful lot of money during that period, and the golden crosses marked times where that trend accelerated to the upside. So it was a really good indicator then. Not so good uh, during the bear market of, say, 2011 to 2015, the end of 2015. It's still marked, in some cases, brief periods and uptrends, but in a bear market, it, it gave some false signals. So I guess the lesson here is if you're in a bull market, it's a good thing to see a golden cross. And again, I think we're in a bull market. 2014 to 23, again, you see the tail end of that bear market, but you see that on the way up, we had some good instances to trade on these golden crosses. So I would give it a or say that this is a very positive indicator. It is not a 100%, uh, but it is a good indicator at this point in the market. Uh, one of the things I follow, and these charts, by the way, come from my friend Ron Grease's uh, service, thechartstore.com. His weekly blog is worth the subscription price alone for that service. And one of the things I've followed over the many years is the 14-week stochastic for gold, thanks to to uh, Ron's charts. I'm not a real market technician, I won't claim to be, but gold tends to move in fairly reliable cycles, more reliable than other asset classes. If you looked at the 14-week stochastic for, say, oil, it would be all over the place and nothing much reliable. But you can see in gold, this momentum indicator shows some fairly reliable swings. What you want to see and you can see in the, say, 2003 to 2008 time frame, that indicator remaining above the 80 level uh, showing sustained upward momentum, kind of a rounding on the top. What we've done just now is soared from a uh, oversold and a false indicator down at the bottom, uh, downward momentum, to really positive momentum. We want to see that persist. So we want to see it stay above the 80 level. Dollar, on the other hand, has downward momentum. It has done the same thing in reverse to gold. Now, I don't believe that the dollar is driving gold, and certainly not vice versa. Both of these are responding to the Fed, to monetary policy again. The, the idea now is that the Fed, it being ahead of other central banks, is going to pause or pivot before the other central banks, although the Canadian... Central Bank, of course, has uh, beat it to the punch. But it is uh, the idea is that the, the Fed will ease first, and therefore the dollar has, is responding. Uh, the dollar is very oversold right now, so that's something to watch as well. Uh, 
as, as gold is a bit overbought. Copper, I'm going to talk about, about briefly. You can see we had a tremendous run, largely due to the reopening story, reopening thing in China. It has also posted a golden cross. But copper is a great long-term story before. Here are LME copper warehouse stocks level. They, they are falling, <clears throat> and Trafigura has recently announced that it's taking its copper off of the LME, um, so they're falling further. Uh, there is a fundamental story still developing in copper. Bottom line, it's a bull market. You should all act accordingly. Those companies out there, these companies at this podium are great opportunities. Don't let the generalists take all the money this time. Beat them to the punch if you can. That's me, goldnewsletter.com, New Orleans Investment Conference, November 1st to 4th this year. And you can follow me on Twitter for sometimes entertaining market commentary.